he uh, is currently the uh, Jerry Cohen Chair of Experimental Physics and an associate uh, professor at uh, uh, MSU, Michigan State University. And he heads a laboratory for quantum systems at MSU and is also the associate director of the MSU Center for Quantum Computing Science and Engineering. Um, he's also the co-founder um, uh, of EroQ Quantum Hardware Corporation, which is currently located in Chicago. Uh, so Johannes has uh, a PhD degree from Northwestern University. And before joining MSU as a faculty, he was an IQIM uh, postdoctoral scholar at uh, the Institute for, Institute for Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech. So Johannes has a, a very diverse background. So his PhD was on uh, superfluid helium-3 systems. Then he moved on to study quantum transport in uh, two-dimensional electron gases at Caltech. And uh, now he has a laboratory which sort of combines the various things that he has done. Uh, and does this very interesting hybrid quantum systems, which combines uh, his expertise in uh, liquid helium and uh, you know electronic systems uh, with superconducting qubits. So it's going to be a very exciting talk. So welcome to all of you, and thanks, Johannes, for joining us. Over to you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you all for uh, for <clears throat> giving me this invitation and opportunity to to speak. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you essentially. Um, a story about why my research group, the Laboratory for Hybrid Quantum Systems at MSU, uh, is excited about uh, building and developing and studying uh, these so-called hybrid quantum systems. And I'll tell you what I mean about those. Um, essentially, what we're interested in doing is taking uh, two or more disparate but complementary quantum systems, say phonons or electrons, circuit quantum circuits, and combining them in a way that allows those systems to interact coherently or dissipatively in some situations um, and to learn about the, the interactions that those systems have. Um, I'll mention I'm also, Johnny, thank you for this, the wonderful introduction you gave. Um, I'll also highlight uh, that MSU is a is a partner of, of this consortium of universities in the Midwest called the, the Midwest Quantum Collaboratory. Um, which involves uh, Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, and Purdue uh, currently. Um, we have over 100 faculty working on various aspects of, of quantum computing and, and quantum information science and engineering, and, and there's a variety of wonderful opportunities um, if there are postdocs and, and graduate students and undergrads listening. Um, you know, take a look if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, future directions in your life. Um, the Midwest Quantum Collaboratory is, is a great um, uh, possibility. So yeah, the title of my talk, you can see, we're going to talk about, you know, hybrid quantum systems, one electron, and in particular, I'm going to highlight one phonon at a time. Um, there's going to be phonons are going to play an important role in, in the story that I'm going to tell you, um, but more on that later. So first, I want to just kind of give you, you know, some idea about why we think these kinds of systems are fun. I've said a little bit, but essentially the, the reason is twofold. On one hand, we're excited about, about making these kinds of hybrid systems and studying their properties because you know nature ultimately speaks a, a fundamentally quantum mechanical language you know the the electrons atoms and phonons are are all talking to each other via hamiltonians and 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 couplings and things like that um and and these kinds of systems when we combine them allow us to study multiple interacting degrees of freedom um at the single or even at the collective level of of these kinds of quantum phenomena so on one hand super fundamental we're excited about physics we want to understand how nature works on the other hand um when you when we've as, as a species we've developed the ability to con create and control these kinds of systems at at, at uh, the level of single excitations single particles that opens the door for some exciting uh technological advances that are possible in particular in the in the form of quantum simulation quantum sensing communication and ultimately quantum computation um, and so, you know, I, I, I find both of these motivations to be equally interesting um, on, and, and worthy of, of, of pursuit. Uh, and so this is kind of the, the high level thing that drives the folks in my research group to, to, to study these kinds of systems. Um, now, I'll, I'll say a little bit, I won't be able to tell you about all the different things that my research group is, is working on. Um, but I want to give you kind of a 10,000 foot overview of, of the different kinds of projects that we have going on. And I'm happy to take questions or talk more about any one of these if, if folks are, are interested. Um, so one of the systems that we study is a trapped electron system um, where we, we float individual electrons 
above the surface of superfluid helium. Um, so these electrons really float about 10 nanometers above this otherwise very pristine superfluid substrate. And then underneath we have some kind of device layer that say has uh, quantum circuits or microwave resonators or surface acoustic wave devices, various kinds of things on the device layer that we want to couple to these electrons and to manipulate them at the at the single or collective uh, electron level. Um, Johnny also mentioned that we have a I, that, that I co-founded a startup company uh, based in Chicago um, where that AeroQ uh, is the name of the company. And what we're trying to do is to utilize the spin degree of freedom of these electrons to develop a processor. Um, Another part of the research in my group is, is um, looking at the uh, collective quantum mechanical phases of matter that can form in low dimensional electron systems like graphene or semiconductor heterostructures. And we study those at, at very low temperatures, you know, tens of millikelvin and, and very high magnetic fields up to like 14 Tesla. And, and really what we're interested in is the many body degrees of freedom and, and uh, states of matter that can form in those systems. We also have a, a quite uh, extensive effort studying hybrid systems based on color center defects in diamond. Um, so these are little naturally occurring uh, uh, qubits that are associated with say a vacancy and an, and an interstitial nitrogen. And this thing operates as a room temperature qubit with quite high coherence. And we're, we, we have a, a project working on, on those kinds of things. And then a big part of our research group works on uh, superconducting circuit based uh, qubits, so transmon qubits or the like. And in particular, this part of the story, the superconducting circuit part, is the one that I'll be telling you um, the most about. So I'll tell you a new, we have some exciting new results on on an, on um, using these kinds of uh, qubits to, to do open quantum systems research. And so that'll be the majority of my story. But like I said, I'm happy to take questions on any of these other aspects if, if folks are interested. And then finally, you know, if 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 you are on, if if at any point in time you get tired of listening to me talk and you want to just check out anything that we're working on in the group, you can go to our website hybridquantumlab.com, or if you if you do Twitter, or Instagram, you can you can follow the, the the things that we have going on um, there. Okay, so so that kind of gives you the the you know the ten thousand foot overview of what we're up to, but. Here's the story that I actually want to tell you about. Um, so we've been doing some open quantum systems research, and I'll say what I mean about open quantum systems, um, using uh, phonons and coupling them to superconducting qubits. Um, and so that story will become more clear as I as I tell you about this. Um, but I'll have to, to to build up to that. We'll have to give a crash course on on what superconducting qubits are and and how they work. Um, how we make these interesting uh, surface acoustic wave phononic resonators. So these are lattice excitations of, of uh, a piezoelectric crystal that we couple to the superconducting qubits. And then I'll tell you about how we, we actually marry those two, um, those two kinds of devices in a hybrid format. Um, and then I'll tell you about the kind of open quantum systems work that we can do um, to, to essentially engineer the phononic environment that the qubit sees and to use it as a resource for dynamical state preparation and, and qubit control. Okay, so let's just go ahead and get started. Um, um, is gonna ask a question, isn't that in the... Yeah, shoot. So before you go ahead, so in terms of the basic idea behind these experiments and, you know, what is the difference between the optomechanical or 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 mechanical nanomechanical hybridization of phonons with mechanical modes and and the qubits plus the acoustic phonons from the acoustic waves that you're talking about is there any fundamental difference in terms of the hybridization and other functionalities no i i think that there's as you'll see from the kinds of experiments we've been doing they're very very similar in many ways um the uh you're exactly right. There's this. There's a. You'll see. You'll you'll see that there's a lot of interest between. Um, uh, there's a lot of connection between optomechanical microwave optomechanical systems and the kinds of phononic resonators that we're going to be building. Um, you know the. The devil is, I mean, the differences are often in the details of how do you make compact devices? How easy is it to like maybe translate this into a technological uh, uh, direction forward? Can you use them for 
transduction, the frequency ranges in which they operate, these kinds of things. Is that, I mean, we're, and one aspect is, is the, right. the you know, I, we're essentially utilizing the non nonlinearity of the qubit, the strong nonlinearity of the okay. qubit to impart that onto the mechanics. Right. But there's got a lot it, of similarities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So superconducting qubits 101, we want to make a, we want to make a, a qubit, a quantum two level system out of a circuit. How do we do that? Well, as you'll, as you may very well know, qubits are quite fragile. Uh, quantum mechanical properties want to disappear into their environment uh, quite easily. So we need to make these things robust. The first thing we want to do is we want to make uh, the circuit dissipationless. You know, so let's use superconducting materials to make the circuit. That'll that'll be very helpful. Um, and the simplest circuit that you can imagine making is just an LC oscillator. Why not? Let's try that. Let's make a let's try to let's try to make a qubit out of that. So we're going to have an inductor and a capacitor. And we can write down, you know, the energy that's shared between, you know, the the magnetic fields that are formed, uh, that are that oscillate in the inductor, and the charges that build up on the capacitor. And if we cool this thing down to low temperatures, it will in fact become a quantum object. Um, we can write down a Hamiltonian that will um, uh, describe the conjugate variables of the the flux in the um, in the inductor and the charge on the capacitor, and they will be, you know, conjugate to one another in, in a Heisenberg fashion. The one kind of annoying thing about a harmonic oscillator is that because the the because it's harmonic, uh, this this LC oscillator will have equally spaced energy levels, each spaced by you know the fundamental frequency times h bar. And what that means is that if we send a control signal in, we have to somehow send some kind of signal that that operates at this frequency omega zero in order to manipulate the 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 state of the system but if we put one in and then put in a second one we just climb up this ladder we can't isolate with a well-defined control signal any two of these levels from the others and so that that's a little unfortunate and and i always like to say that schrodinger's cat doesn't like making qubits out of out of harmonic oscillators so we need to be a little bit more ingenious and thankfully, there's there's a relatively easy way to do this. We can use a we can enter we can replace that inductor that I had um, previously with a with a uh, a device that has been um, uh, that that introduces nonlinearity into the system essentially. And that device is a Josephson junction. It's really just a it's a very simple uh, circuit element. It involves a insulator sandwiched between two superconducting leads. And the, the superconducting order parameter of on one side can tunnel into the other and back and forth if, if needed. So there a phase degree of freedom can can uh, a gradient in the uh, in the phase of the superconducting wave function appears across this boundary. And essentially that gives us all that, that we need to introduce nonlinearity. Um, and, and a simple way, and it's represented by this little X in, in circuit diagrams. And uh, this inductance, uh, Essentially, the way you can think about this thing is, is it, it, it's a nonlinear inductor that depends where the inductance of the junction depends on the current that flows through it. Um, and this is what actually one of these little devices looks like. So there's superconductor on this side, there's superconductor on this side, and they're sandwiched vertically with a, a, a thin oxide barrier between them. So this is aluminum, this is aluminum, and then there's aluminum oxide between the two uh, leads. And then you can just these are relatively straightforward to fabricate and, and then you can build them into ever more complex circuits. And the cool thing is, is that if you then quantize this kind of uh, circuit, you again get a, a Hamiltonian and you can write down uh, essentially the energy of the, the states that are that are formed in this kind of circuit. And it's not uh, because of the nonlinearity of the Josephson junction. It is not harmonic. It actually has this cosine uh, uh, potential. And now these energy levels of the of the oscillations of the current and charge in the circuit are no longer equally spaced. They're they're slightly different from one another. And so that means that if you have a sufficiently well controlled control signal, you can now just isolate, say, these two lower levels from all of the other ones. And you can manipulate this thing as a quantum two level system. So you get a qubit out of this. Um, and and this kind of scheme essentially is the you know i've got this this picture here in the middle with a josephson junction and a capacitor but this kind of circuit essentially forms the backbone of almost every superconducting circuit quantum computing effort that's out there so the 
these kinds of circuits are often referred to as transmon qubits. That's just, that's jargon. You don't need to, it's essentially not relevant, but the, the circuit, the qubit circuit looks like this, and then you have to couple to it with some kind of microwave control line. And so these pictures, these from IBM on the left, this is a circ this is an eight qubit processor from Google from really some time ago now. Um, these are processors from Rigetti. And each one of these look a little bit different, but essentially at the heart of them are capacitors, uh, Josephson junctions, and these little meandering lines are the control signals, control lines that bring in microwave uh, excitations to, to control the qubit. And you, we at in my lab use circuits that are very similar, except um, they, they look a little bit different. They look like this. So the qubit here is living on this chip uh, that's sitting inside of this, this large uh, aluminum box. But the, the qubit actually resides on this, on this um, chip. And this box is now the way in which we introduce uh, microwave control signals. So this is a, this is the, it's a, it's a microwave resonating cavity. And by putting signals into and reading out the signals from the cavity, um, the microwave resonating cavity, we can infer the state of the qubit. And with this relatively simple uh, setup, you can perform essentially any quantum single qubit kind of experiment that you would want. So you can, you know, the, the states of the qubit, we're going to isolate the bottom two, we're going to call them zero and one, and we can, you know, perform um, rotations of the, the qubit. We can put it in its excited state, see how long it takes to, to decay into its ground state. We can do full state um, tomography. We can we can read out everything that we need to about this. Um, now, if I zoom in on this on this chip right here, just to give you, you know, a sense of what the circuit looks like, here's one of those little Josephson junctions that's fabricated on the on the device that forms the, the nonlinear inductor. And the capacitors, the capacitive part of the circuit is really, if you follow these wires that go up and down out of the, the, the little square here, they go onto these large millimeter scale antenna pads. And those, it's actually the capacitance between those that forms the capacitor um, in the, in the, in the nonlinear LC circuit that we're going to use for the qubit. Um, now these large pads allow us not only to, to to create the capacitance that we need for the, the circuit, um, but they also couple to the microwave control signals in this cavity. So they form, um, essentially we make a dipole antenna uh, onto the qubit, and then that dipole antenna couples to the free space microwave fields inside of this inside of this box. So that's, that's you know, this thing, this thing we have to go to a clean room to fabricate and, and um, do, you know, all of uh, like nano, fabrication stuff to make this thing but the box we make in our machine shop so this is just a you you know on a mill we cut out a, a slot inside of a block of aluminum and then and then sandwich another half on top um, so the microwave resonator is quite quite straightforward oh and i should mention i've said microwave signal a number of times but to give you a sense of what the, that actually is in in frequency units these things operate typically in the 5 to 10 gigahertz um, frequency range both the cavity, the microwave cavity, and the qubit. So we designed them to have that frequency range of operation. Um, and the reason for that is, is that if you take five gigahertz and turn it into temperature units, uh, that corresponds to about 250 millikelvin. And so if we take uh, one of these devices and we attach it to the mixing chamber of our dilution refrigerator, which just passively cools down to 10 millikelvin, all of the, the elements will cool into their quantum mechanical ground state quite easily. And, and to high, uh, a high level of, of uh, fidelity. So just a little bit more about how we actually read out and measure this qubit. So I said we send in microwave signals at these kinds of frequencies, but essentially what we're doing is we're borrowing a page from quantum optics. So in quantum optics, you take an atom and you put it into a laser cavity and, and you use the, the laser light bounces around and you can use it to manipulate the state of the atom. You should think very similarly here about this, this setup. The circuit is in effect a, a, a synthetic atom. It has quantized energy levels. We place it into an electromagnetic resonator that just happens to be at a, the photons happen to be at a, at a much lower frequency than, than optical light. Um, but they're bouncing around and we use those to control uh, the qubit very much like quantum optics. 
And in particular, this system is governed by the James Cummings Hamiltonian of quantum optics. So we have a term that describes the qubit. That's this. Oh, I am having a Microsoft problem. I apologize for that. Let me restart. You can still hear me, I'm guessing. All right. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, hopefully that doesn't happen again. I thought this is always this is always a lot of fun. So sorry for that. Give me one second to get restarted here. Where was I? I was here. Okay, can you see my slides again? Yes. Great. Okay. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that doesn't happen. Usually when it happens once, it's not a, a good sign. Um, but yeah, so so this Hamiltonian describes the system. We have our, our qubit, which is just a sigma z operator. We have um, a harmonic oscillator degree of freedom, which is just associated with the microwave cavity. And then we have some coupling between those two with some coupling constant g. So g essentially just parameterizes how well these two things are coupled. There's um, uh, so if we, you know, introduce a photon into the cavity by this raising operator a dagger, that causes the uh, uh, sorry. If the if the if a photon is is created in the cavity, that causes. Oh boy, this is really not very good. Okay, let me. What is going on? Let me do one thing very quick that will hopefully solve this problem. We're going to give up on PowerPoint for a moment, and I'm going to switch to PDF. Give me. I should have done this ahead of time. Okay. Okay, can you see the the PDF? Yes. And you can see this. Yeah, yeah. Good. Great. Great. This will not crash. So let me see if I can do one thing. Hold on. This is, yeah, that's okay. Great. Um, so, and you can see my mouse, sort of. Yeah. Wiggling around. Can you, Great. Yeah, can you. yeah. So, I apologize for the aspect ratio, but I think that's maybe just going to have to be to live with. Um, so, so, we have this Hamiltonian, and we're going to often operate uh, the qubit in the microwave cavity. Uh, in what's called the dispersive coupling regime. So what, what that means is we're going to detune the frequency of the qubit relative to the cavity by quite some amount. And then if you do that sufficiently, uh, you can essentially do perturbation theory on this Hamiltonian in this parameter g squared over delta. Um, and that will allow you essentially to, to regroup, and then you can regroup terms in that Hamiltonian. And if you do so in a, in a I've done so here in a suggestive way that groups this qubit shift, the qubit state with the cavity. And you can see that in this formulation, in this dispersive coupling regime, the cavity frequency is effectively changed by the state of the qubit. So when you cool this thing down to low temperatures, the cavity and the qubit really don't become, dis they're no longer, you can't think of them as distinct objects from one another. They're really very much coupled to one another. And by reading out the state of the cavity, you can, by reading out the, the frequency of the cavity, you can infer the state of the qubit by this, by this process. Um, and so that's actually very useful. And you'll see we can do that with, in, in a variety of different contexts. Okay, so that's the superconducting qubit part. Now what I want to tell you about is the surface acoustic wave part. So we have, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to couple the phone, these are going to be the phononic degrees of freedom that we couple to the qubit. And 
what a surface acoustic wave is, is the following. Imagine you have a piezoelectric crystal, and if there's a wave that, that propagates on the surface of that crystal, um, that's, that's the surface acoustic wave. And that wave via reciprocity will have, you know, via the mechanical strain of the wave will also have uh, dynamical electric fields um, be because of the piezoelectricity that can be utilized to, to couple to the qubit. Um, and essentially what we're going to do is we're going to fabricate tiny little um, cavities for these surface phonons. So you should really think of like waves on the surface of the ocean, but they're waves on the surface of this of this piezoelectric crystal. And we can perform, uh, we can, in, in fa using fabrication, we can make little launchers for these surface acoustic waves. So that's this this red section in the middle, and, and then mirrors on either side that reflect the surface phonons and can trap them inside of this inside of this uh, kind of device. And then we can utilize something that's very similar to the, the framework that I described with the microwave cavity, but to couple the qubit to these, these phononic resonators now. And just to give you a sense of the numbers, the speed of sound on the surface of whoop, the speed of sound on the surface of, of uh, a piezoelectric crystal like lithium niobate is about 4,000 meters per second. Um, and so that means is that if we fabricate uh, little interdigitated uh, transducers like this one here in the middle, um, what they, with, with a, a wavelength of about a micron, that corresponds to a frequency about four gigahertz, which is right in the same kind of range that we want to operate the qubits. And Question. what we do, we, oh, go ahead. So what are these mirrors made of? They're, oh yeah, so great, thank you, sorry. So I was just about to say that. So we take this crystal and what we do is we fabricate um, just an interdigitated metallic structure. It looks really just like what I'm showing you on the screen here. They're made out of aluminum, say, and it's just a, a, um, a set of, of long, thin wires that are interdigitated with one another. The mirrors are the same. They're just strips of aluminum that are on either side. and by controlling how many of them you you put there, that gives you a certain amount of mirror reflectivity. And because the if you the central region essentially launches these surface phonons to the left and right. So if we um, uh, if we apply a high frequency electromagnetic signal to this central interdigitated uh, structure, it will strain the underlying crystal because of the piezoelectric effect, and that will launch surface phonons to the left and right. And then those will be reflected by these mirrors with some probability per finger per metal strip. Does that answer your question? Of DFB. Yeah, they're just they're just honest to goodness, they're just strips of metal. I'll show you what the 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 devices look like. But it forms so, this. So is, this is like a Bragg reflection, right? Isn't that the it is. thing? That's, yeah, that's right. what I said. Sort of DFB. Oh, that's what you said. Yes. Yes, yeah. it's just Bragg reflection. They're Bragg reflectors on either side. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and we utilize um, uh, this so we can design because so the, the kind of amazing thing about this is, is that these kinds of surface acoustic wave devices, you may not know that you have them, but they exist in your cell phone. Um, there are this is a well-known microwave telecom technology that has been used for a long time for making delay lines and signal filters and all kinds of things that you need for for. Uh, cell phone operation, and essentially what we're doing is making the quantum analogs of those those kinds of devices. But the cool thing is, is that since this is like a really commercial uh, technology, we can leverage all of the simulation, the classical simulation software that that is readily available to design these kinds of devices to have the properties that we want. So we use it's called the coupling of modes theory, and we utilize that to, to create these kinds of devices. And so I'll show you some simulations of the device that 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 I'm gonna that we're gonna use in these experiments. Um, so and we can we can essentially get any kind of spectral response we want. So we can design. So here, what I'm showing you is the the effective electrical conductance of this central red interdigitated transducer as a function of frequency. And it has this kind of broad response. Essentially, what you should think of is this electrical conductance essentially maps onto a phononic conductance in the in the in the device. So where this is where there's a peak here, that's the frequency at which phonons are maximally launched to the left and right. Similarly, we can simulate the mirror, the Bragg reflector response 
um, and you get uh, uh, something that looks like this. So I'm plotting the, ref the reflection of the mirrors as a function of frequency. There's some narrow stop band in which phonons are trapped. And then this kind of periodically decaying uh, reflection coefficient on either side. And so what if you take this kind of IDT interdigitated transducer response, this kind of mirror response and put them together, what you get is a total device performance that looks like this. So this device traps a single acoustic mode in the mirror. So we have one peak here in the in the conductance. And then you see this kind of broad continuum of of phononic excitations that exist on either side. So another way to think of this, this effective conductance is this is in some sense a proxy for the phonon, the surface phonon density of states that we can engineer uh, in this device. And so in this one, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a single peak and then this continuum. So I said a little bit about why you might want to do couple these kinds of phonons to, to superconducting qubits, but here's here's some kind of you know we're we're certainly not the only group in the world working on these kinds of uh, directions. There's a there's a number of them, and and I believe even Amazon's quantum computing team is is interested in in coupling mechanics and superconducting qubits. Um, and the part of the reason is it's exciting because we can control these mechanical degrees of freedom using the qubit and interface these these two systems. Um, it allows us to explore exotic new regimes of circuit quantum optics using using high frequency sound, these these phonon uh, things. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things technologically is that because the speed of sound is about five orders of magnitude uh, slower than light at the same frequency, this means that these devices can be quite compact. So I showed you that microwave resonator that operated at about five gigahertz. And you know, it you're essentially building, if you use microwave photons um, at five gigahertz, you have a length scale in your quantum computer that has that's you know centimeter scale or many, at least many hundred, many tens of millimeters. And that's not terribly scalable. Um, and so, or it presents at least many challenges to scale. However, if you make phononic resonators that operate in the same frequency range, you can make everything essentially five orders of magnitude smaller. Um, and so that's quite exciting. Um, uh, and, Giannis, can I, uh, can I, can, sorry, can I ask a quick question on that yep. point? Um, so it also means that your qubit now will have to be coupled to a solid state system because you need a semiconductor or some surface, piezoelectric surface. So wouldn't that increase the decoherence and other problems because now you need a substrate that the qubit needs to be coupled to? Yeah, that's right. Um, and so you'll see what we do is we do a flip chip. We get around that a little bit by performing a flip chip operation. So we make the qubits on one substrate, we make the saw devices on another and then couple them independently. A lot of the groups have really headed in that direction, but you're absolutely right. Actually, one of the things that is really challenging in this regard and that a lot of the various groups that are working on this are, are looking at right now are how to avoid unwanted couplings to various kinds of phonon modes that you don't design in the device because those become parasitic loss channels but you're absolutely right there's this you know with quantum computing there's probably no free lunch you gotta you have to pick which battle you want to fight at the end of the day right thanks um, yeah. yeah so um, i have another related question sorry so yeah uh, so it's at the end of the day it's it's a, a surface acoustic wave so in our devices yes yeah uh, so fundamentally, is there a difference between, uh, let's say, how the uh, circuit uh, or the superconducting qubit that's going to couple with this acoustic wave versus the one, uh, let's say, which is uh, an optical wave, which is your, uh, you know, microwave signal that you are sending out? So is there a fundamental difference between the two in terms of the coupling? In terms of the in terms of the, the coupling is in the details of how it's engineered. In our case, what you'll see how I'll, I'll say a little bit about how we do this coupling. Um, but in principle, I mean, no, I mean, we're going to in. It, do, it doesn't have to be different. Um, and you're ult we're ultimately utilizing the elect, uh, you know, the the electric fields that are generated by the surface acoustic wave to to mediate, you know, charge imbalance the, in the qubit that creates the coupling very much like an electromagnetic field. So at the end of the day, it's it's people have there are various other schemes that that other groups utilize um, to do these things. But 
that's that's sort of the engineering challenge and it depends on the the system okay is that helpful um yeah like i said there's here's some you know i just listed some nice references of some of the other groups around the world that are working on this um and yeah take a look there's a bunch of great work that people are doing and so the way we are going to mediate this coupling um is that we're going to fabricate one of these uh device one of these these acoustic brag reflector surface acoustic wave resonators onto our you know our favorite piezoelectric we use right now lithium niobate but people use gallium arsenide also and then we're going to just flip the qubit directly on top of that and we're going to mediate the coupling between these two devices via the capacitor the capacitive coupling between the antenna pads on the qubit and these large scale antenna pads that we're going to fabricate onto the surface acoustic wave device and then it's just a parallel plate capacitor coupling between these two um in this flip chip kind of scheme and then the name of the game is is that we're going to try to engineer fun hamiltonians that we can we can understand um this is what an actual picture of one of these devices looks like so we have Here's the, the central surface acoustic wave launcher, the Bragg reflectors on either side, and then we fabricate these large uh, antenna pads onto the surface acoustic wave device as well, and then put a qubit on top. And so in terms of the, the circuit, this is actually slightly incorrect. We have, there's, there's, you should imagine another capacitor down here, but essentially these antenna pads form this coupling between the qubit circuit and the surface acoustic wave device. And then there's one technical piece, which is we're actually, remember I showed you qubits that had just a capacitor and a single Josephson junction. Here we're going to use a, um, a capacitor and two Josephson junctions in this, in this loop geometry. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to introduce an external flux, a magnetic flux that allows us to tune the frequency of this qubit. And then we house all of that in this three-dimensional copper microwave box. So let's, uh, so let's Johannes, look at some. Can I, yeah. can I just ask a quick question? So earlier you mentioned that uh, you would want to get rid of this microwave, the, the box, right? This large yeah. unit that you have. So, so what exactly is the role that it's playing right now? I mean, yeah, for in our experiments, I mean, ultimately, if you want to build a like if you want to make compact devices, you can people have shown that you don't need, you know, microwave. Stuff you can you can do all of this without the microwave cavity. We don't because we're not trying to as you'll see we're trying to do experiments and we're not really trying to build a, a quantum computer with this particular technology um and so here the microwave cavity really just works the same way as it did in what i was telling you before which is it's just the way we do the readout and control of the the chips in the middle okay. so the the microwave cavity is there just for readout and control okay okay yeah thank you and so let's do the first thing i can show you is some spectroscopic results so what i'm showing you here this is actually now real data on this device um the color map is essentially the transmission of the microwave photons that go in and out of that 3d cavity that that's our proxy for everything that's happening um and so you can see that we have this this bright red line essentially associate is associated with the qubit transition which we can tune again with magnetic flux so to move along the x-axis all we're doing is changing an external magnetic field that that um, changes the frequency of the the superconducting qubit and you can see that when we come into to proximity of where we designed this strongly um, confined acoustic mode we see a nice avoided crossing between the qubit and the um, and the uh, the acoustic mode which corresponds to the the strong coupling limit of of the phonon and the qubit and it actually and you can see actually all of this this quasi continuum of states is imparted on the qubit as well so all these fringes are associated with the designed uh phononic environment that we've we've created for the the qubit um and in this i want to focus on this on this region where this avoided crossing is and this we can fit this and actually extract the coupling now between the phonons and the qubit and in this regime where this avoided crossing happens where the, that coupling is actually significantly higher than the loss of either the qubit or the phonons in the resonator and what that means is that if we place an excitation into the system the system is hybridized here and the excitation is actually shared coherently between the qubit and the the saw resonator 
And this regime of coherent quantum acoustics is one that we and a bunch of other people have been studying for some time now. Um, and there's all kinds of cool experiments that you can do in this regime where where this coupling is much, much larger than the loss of, of either system. Um, but what, for example, one of the things that you can do is you can say, place the qubit way over here at this frequency, and then we can send independently another microwave signal that can be used to populate the phonon resonator. And in this regime, we're operating in this dispersive uh, regime of this James Cummings Hamiltonian that I told you about previously, and we can actually see a frequency shift on the qubit that's proportional to the number of phonons that we, that, or is changed by the number of phonons that we put into uh, the surface acoustic wave resonator. And so what this allows us to do is, so this is in some sense, uh, this is this is analogous to the AC stark shift of, of an atom uh, in an electromagnetic field, except here the atom is the synthetic uh, uh, atom of the qubit, and the electromagnetic field is replaced by the number operator of how many phonons do we place in. And so we can measure that stark shift as we increase the number of phonons, and you know, this data here is for essentially, we put about six phonons into the resonator to get a shift of about 15 megahertz on the qubit. Um, I'll note that there's also this this interesting uh, term over here to the to the right. This is the lamb shift of quantum optics. Um, so we that's there too, but we just we can't con there's nothing to change. We can't see it. It's just an offset. And what this actually this this kind of technique of using this coherent coupling to the phonons allows us to actually calibrate by by measuring the shift, we can calibrate that and use that to make the qubit into a sensor for its phononic environment. And we've recently found that um, that there's all kinds of interesting things going on in these kinds of devices. In particular, there's there's interference of various phonon modes in this device uh, that we can infer um, by measuring the frequency shift of the qubit. And there's a we have a new paper on the archive about about this, but I won't say more unless someone has some some questions. Um, the but but what I want to really emphasize is there's another regime here, which is this this region out here away from the place where we've confined this single phonon mode in the resonator. We can go operate in the in the regime of this this uh, quasi continuum of states, and we can actually look at what happens when dissipation can't be ignored. In particular, we can operate when G this coupling is less than or approximately equal to the the rates of either of these two. Um, and in fact, we've shown that, and, and I'll tell you here about how we can use these kinds of states for, for actually using dissipation as a resource for, for uh, studying um, uh, what kinds of things you can do to the qubit in, in a controlled fashion. So this is where the open quantum systems part that I alluded to earlier comes in. Um, so just to get everybody on the same page of what we're gonna be doing in this kind of open quantum systems experiment, in this in this dissipative region, um, so normally when you learn about quantum mechanics for the first time, you think about you have a system that's governed by some Schrödinger equation, and you try to ignore the environment. Um, but no system is perfectly isolated from its environment. You are always operating in a situation where the system is coupled to some environment, and and normally you think. So, so that necessitates the need. You have the system Hamiltonian, but you you lose some amount of information to the environment. And and um, normally you want to minimize that coupling, but you always have to kind of operate um, in terms of trying to understand what the reduced density matrix is for your for your system. And normally you think of decoherence as being completely bad. Um, well, it turns out that in certain contexts, if you can engineer the environment, if you can engineer, say, the density of states of the environment or the coupling between your system and your environment, you can actually do, it's not just bad. You can learn interesting things about the environment. You can actually utilize the environmental degrees of freedom to stabilize dynamically various qubit states in the form of bath engineering. And it opens a door to studying effective non-Hermitian physics, which which is something that we've been thinking about doing after in 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 the relatively near future. Um, and so, just to give the punchline before I go into any of the details, we're going to study an open quantum system in which we think of the phononic degrees of freedom in this quasi continuum as the environment and the qubit as the system. And then we're going to introduce we're going to understand the dissipation. 
we're going to introduce dynamics that we can control and then we're going to model the entire system in terms of in terms of a markovian master equation that tells us about how the system loses information to the environment and so this kind of thing has been done by a number of groups using photons um, and we're the first ones uh, to my knowledge to really push the envelope on this in using using a bat or an environment of phonons that we can control. OK, so we need some elements. We need the qubit and its environment. Um, like I said, this is going to we're going to we're going to model things in terms of the Markovian master equation where we have some jump operators that that drive transitions in the of the qubit so we can excite and de-excite the qubit we can we can measure its expectation value etc and if you think about the qubit as a vector on the block sphere you know you have the the simplest state is essentially the ground state um and you know you can imagine some some other state that doesn't reside on the surface of the block sphere but lives kind of inside and what that corresponds to is the system having lost some of its information to the environment. If the system loses no information to its environment, this vector would live somewhere on the block sphere. And if the system loses all of its information to the environment, you just live right at the center of the block sphere. And that's the that's the regime that is less interesting. And we're going to parametrize how much information the system loses to its environment in terms of the state purity, which is essentially just given by the, the trace of the, the density matrix squared. Okay. So that's that's what we want to do. So we have to understand the phononic dissipation in our device. So what we're going to do, what I'm showing you here is measurements of of one over the qubit energy relaxation time. So this is essentially how long the qubit takes to, to lose energy to its environment. And the blue data here, the blue points are the data and the green is uh, the device conduct the surface acoustic wave device conductance over the same frequency range. And as you can see, they track each other quite well. And what this means, what we're essentially doing is out here, where we're, we're, we're at a frequency range where we're far away from that, that confined mode, and out here, the phonons essentially act as a dissipation channel to the qubit. And actually, what this data shows is that we can completely tailor the qubit dissipation in terms of, of its loss into phonons. So when I say loss, what I really mean is most of the phonons here just leak out of the mirrors. So they just go through, they exit the Bragg mirrors um, because we've designed the reflectivity to be quite low. So that's the environment. Now I said we're going to introduce some dynamics. So what we're going to do is we're going to also apply a microwave drive to the qubit, and you'll see why that's important in a minute. But if we if we take the qubit and we drive it at some frequency omega d, what happens is the system Hamiltonian uh, is no longer uh, diagonal in the qubit basis. So the, the qubit states in the absence of drive are no longer the eigenstates of, of this driven Hamiltonian uh, that we're um, in. And so in this particular case, we're going to be driving about the, the y-axis of the, the block sphere. Um, and we're going to drive with, uh, um, uh, so there's going to be some Rabi frequency between, between the, uh, in the driven frame, and there's going to be some detuning between the, the the drive that we apply in the qubit. And one way to think about this in terms of this block sphere picture is that what we're doing is we're taking the the excited state and the ground state in the absence of drive, and we're essentially just rotating uh, the the eigenstates into into a new frame that is dressed by the the drive that we're applying. Um, and that you get the in that frame you get these two new eigenstates g tilde uh, g tilde and e tilde that are separated from one another by the the Rabi frequency. And you know just to give you a sense of how those angles are and how they relate to these drive parameters, that's the that's the so we we can control the amplitude of the drive which controls the Rabi frequency and we can control the detuning. Um, and then we have to then. To, to figure out what all the eigenstates are, we have to just do quantum 101 and rotate, perform matrix rotation to, to get into this new, this new frame. And in that frame, the Hamiltonian is diagonal in this new uh, um, uh, basis with sigma z tilde now describing the, the, the uh, qubit state in the presence of the drive. Okay. And now if we want to understand the combined effects of the drive and the environment, we have to take that whole Markovian master equation and we have to rotate it. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to rotate each of the operators so that that we're now thinking about the system in a frame that's dri that's dressed by the the drive. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight that these these new eigenstates G tilde and E tilde that that are the eigenstates in the in the driven frame. Um, there are a pair of operators or there are a pair of uh, uh, um, these rates gamma plus and gamma minus that correspond to the rate at which excitations are are exchanged between these two states. Um, and as you'll see, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the dissipation to tailor these states to tailor these rates in a way that we want. OK, so in particular, what I'm going to show you here is a is a slice of the data. This is how we do the experiment. We're going to position ourselves at uh, we're going to position the qubit at a frequency of four gigahertz here where the the phononic density of states is varying quite wild, uh, quite markedly. And that means that these gamma plus and gamma minus rates are not equal to one another. So one is preferred over the other. And what that means is that if we're if we're driving the qubit. If those rates were perfectly equal, the e, e tilde and g tilde states would be completely equally populated. However, in the in the presence of the loss uh, imparted by the saw phonons, one of those states is actually preferred. And we can reconstruct that state um, by driving the qubit, stopping the drive, and then performing state tomography to reconstruct what the what the expectation values are of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And what we find is that you can see in this in this particular uh, sorry in this particular example, we can create a state for very long drive durations that has a purity that's quite high. Here in this example, it's about 86%. So this qubit actually stabilizes itself dynamically onto a position onto a state on the block sphere, um, or it, actually it's inside the block sphere, but kind of close to the surface. Um, that that is very far away from from you know the situation uh, where uh, the qubit has lost all of its information to the to the to the environment, and so we've actually utilized in this example to the ability to create a, a state that is stabilized by the combined uh, aspects of of dissipation and drive. Another way to think about this kind of protocol is that. We're effectively using the saw phonons to cool the qubit. Um, so, because at these for these long drive durations, the the state of the qubit is no longer evolving in time. You can see it's reached some steady state value. We can assume in this situation that the qubit is in thermal equilibrium with its environment, and we can use standard statistical mechanics to to calculate what the effective temperature of such a qubit state would be. So, for example, in the data that I'm showing you here, this corresponds, the state that we've stabilized corresponds to an effective temperature of about 250 microkelvin, which is much lower than the 10 millikelvin environment that we've placed the qubit into. Now, keep in mind, this is an effective temperature. Nothing is, you know, the qubit, there's, you know, the, the chip is not at 250 microkelvin. It's just that if you wanted to stabilize a, a state that has this, um, uh, this this uh, purity, you would need to cool the qubit down to about, you'd have to cool your cryostat down to about 250 microkelvin to, to achieve that. Um, so we can, we can play this game of uh, looking at the state reconstruction at various positions along this phononic density of states. So for example, if we, and, and what, what I'm showing you here in these color maps is just one at one component of the uh, uh, of the qubit expectation values. This is just sigma x, and what you can see is if we position ourselves here, where the density of states of phonons is quite flat, we can reconstruct for for various Rabi uh, detunings and and Rabi drives. We can get uh, we can get various levels of state stabilization, in particular. This I want to highlight this region, this this region in the in the center here, uh, that's white. Uh, that corresponds to the situation in which these gamma plus and gamma minus operators actually cancel one another out, um, and and there's no state stabilization. 
but on either side, we can get either positive or negative values of sigma x. And we can play this game at a variety of these different positions, um, depending on how we've engineered the density of phononic states. And we can see that these, whoops, um, that these, uh, this line of zero coherence transitions upward or downward as, as one might expect. And depending on, on how we drive this, we can get different levels of, of state stabilization. Now we can go a step further and actually simulate what we would expect based on that open quantum systems Markovian master equation. And so what I'm showing you here is, is the results of the simulation for, for this device right next to the data. And you can see there's quite good agreement. So we can actually, we can, we can understand the dynamics and the steady state of the, the qubit in the presence of drive and dissipation. And then we can, we can simulate it uh, and get, it get really great agreement. Um, and these are just more examples of, of this kind of thing. Um, so essentially what I've, that's more or less the entire story that I wanted to tell you about this phononic bath engineering. Um, and what I hope you, you take away from this is that we can, we can, we've sort of, we've demonstrated for the first time, I think a, a phononic open quantum system that, that works for uh, superconducting qubits with these surface acoustic wave resonators. Um, We've shown that you can use this kind of phononic dissipation to pr dynamically prepare and stabilize qubit states in the in the combined presence of drive and dissipation. And one of the cool things that this actually opens up the possibility for is that if you have if you can control gain or loss in a system, you can actually engineer um, Hamiltonians that are non-Hermitian. So normally you learn in quantum mechanics 101 that all Hamiltonians uh, are Hermitian. Otherwise, quantum mechanics doesn't work. That's actually not totally true. Um, you can engineer uh, subsystems that have effectively non-Hermitian Hamiltonians that host exceptional points and interesting topology. And that's one of the things that we're working on right now with, with this kind of device. But if you want to if you want to learn any more, see more details about this bath engineering result, we have it here. Hopefully the review is going to be done soon and, and this will actually be published. Um, and yeah, that's that's essentially the whole thing that I wanted to tell you. Um, now, the the last thing I want to, you know, I, I I get to come here and 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 tell you about all this this exciting work that we're doing. But these are the folks who actually do the heavy lifting uh, to make these kinds of experiments work. In particular, this um, the experiment that I told you about today is really uh, the the effort that has been pushed forward by graduate student Joe Kitzman and uh, and Cameron Undershoot. Um, and they've recently been working with a new postdoc in the group, um, Pranay Rath, who is is pushing the envelope on the next set of, of experiments that we're doing in this direction. Um, and these other people work on, they, they, it's a very collaborative group, so everybody is essentially involved in, in everything that we do. I'll just also highlight that the grad students Camille Michaelis and grad student Austin Schleissner are really spearheading the work that we do with um, these trapped electron hybrid quantum systems. So if anybody wants to ask, I can, I'm happy to, to say more about that. But um, yeah, and finally, I you know none of this would be possible without the people who provide support in the form of funding for this kind of work. Uh, the work that I talked about today is primarily funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll take any questions that you all have. Sorry about the technical difficulties, both at the beginning and, and in the middle, and thanks for your patience. Hopefully, hopefully you all enjoyed the talk. Um, uh, excellent. So uh, I'm Akshay this side. I'm taking over from Chandni. I think she's driving. So, gotcha. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, thanks for the great talk. Oh, I should also uh, just confirm Pranay Rath is a ISC, was an ISC PhD student, I think, if I'm not. That's mistaken. right. He he was a, he was a student with uh, Ambarish Ghosh. OK, OK, excellent. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, because I, I remember his face. Excellent. Yeah. OK, yeah. so uh, questions from the audience. Please just use the raise hand button and ask questions. see some hands. Yeah, so I have uh, yeah. one question, Akshay. Uh, they both, please go ahead. So very interesting talk, uh, to be honest. Uh, so uh, typically when people show avoided crossing, right? Uh, yeah. You know, you see these new dressed modes, which are symmetric, but somehow yes. the avoided crossing you had uh, was sharper on one side than the other. Yes, uh, this so is that's hilarious that I you're asking that. this question. We were yeah. just talking about this exact point with my grad students yesterday. So I, so I, 
I think what's happening is that we really have these other modes that are really becoming important. Let me go to, so for example, um, so here you're saying, why does it peak out so sharply over here on the left? And then over here, it kind of like, some of these go out far, but they really not, it's, it is quite asymmetric. Um, and I think what's happening is, it's, is that these modes on either side are becoming really important and that you're, that the, the strength of the, the crossing is actually like doing the simple fitting with, with a single, you know, coupling G is actually probably not so valid. In fact, we know from some recent results that we've been doing that if we do spectroscopy, we can actually utilize this frequency shift um, that that um, uh, of the qubit by the soft phonons to do spectroscopy of the resonator. And it has a very non-Lorentzian line shape. It actually has a Fano line shape. Mm -hmm. And what we think is happening is, is that there's actually quite a lot of interference between phonons in this confined mode and in this continuum. Right. Actually, we can see those, We and then we see those in another way. We've been doing time domain measurements of this, so we can actually load a coherent state of phonons into the resonator and then measure T1 and T2 of the phonons. And what we find is, is in, depending on where we sit, we can actually see quite non-exponential behavior. Again, because I think what's happening is you're getting just a mess of phononic interference in this device. Yeah. Yeah, so a related question I had was uh, in terms of you presented the coupling of qubit to the, you know, uh, these acoustic modes on the piezo surface. Mm -hmm. um, so I would imagine like the electric field, which when, you know, there is this uh, standing wave forming between two uh, of these reflectors would be in plane. So if you put a qubit, which is orthogonal to that, why there should yeah. be a coupling at all? Yeah, the coupling is really engineered via these pads. So what happens is when the so in the song the way the way I think about it is imagine you've got this thing responding imagine there's just the saw device and you've got this phononic mode trapped in here what that does is it creates an alternating charge imbalance on these pads so you get just static charge that well it's not static but it's dynamic at the frequency of of the the saw resonator that charge then actually just directly couples to the pads that are above it. So the, the qubit pads are on the on an alt on another substrate that's 30 microns away. And just it's that's the thing that forms the coupling between yeah. these two. But OK, I think maybe I misunderstood, but your uh, qubit dipole is aligned to the saw dipole. I guess that's what you they are not orthogonal. That's right. Okay. That's right. The saw waves are orthogonal, but the dipole is actually in the same direction. Yes, okay. that's right. And here the 3D cavity is just a sample box with the large bandwidth, I suppose. Uh, right, that's right. It just gives us, we just use the, it's really just for readout and control. It doesn't give us anything right. more than that. It actually, it, will, it, it allows us to, to also, you know, one of the things that we sort of didn't fully appreciate until we started trying to do it was that when we, when I draw this line, like we have this saw mode that lives here, we can excite that via free space coupling to the 3D cavity, which initially was not totally obvious to me because the impedance mismatch between the cavity and the saw resonator is quite high. Um, yeah. But it, it, you don't actually need that much uh, impedance matching in order to get it to work. Yeah, some power would still couple, yeah. Yeah, it's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vivek. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Vivek from IIC, uh, a really interesting talk. So actually I come from a, uh, uh, my, uh, let's say spectroscopy background and, and when you mm -hmm. mentioned about, uh, you know, the open quantum system with the qubit interacting with the phonon bath uh, and you gave that analogy of block sphere, uh, I actually started uh, uh, making this analogy with, you know, you have uh, in NMR, you have spin dipoles, uh, or in optics you have, or uh, in like, you know, electronic spectroscopy, you have transition dipoles, and then you can actually engineer pulses uh, such that, uh, you know, you can reverse the dephasing between two such dipoles, you know, uh, spin echo or, or photon right. echo. So, uh, uh, you know, as a thought experiment, if let's say you had coupled qubits, uh, can you engineer, you know, uh, microwave pulses so as to reverse the effect of dephasing because of the photon path? Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. I mean, it, I think in depending on 
I mean, if those things are time reversible, then there's no reason that echoing them out doesn't work. And it's no like qubit, um, various kinds of dynamical decoupling schemes and dephasing yeah. correction schemes like this are used routinely in, in superconducting qubits. Um, okay. So, I mean, in this yeah. case, it would be, uh, you know, you sort of uh, reverse the effect of the phonon bath. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting like idea. Um, I see. Oh, I see. You're asking very specifically in this situation. I haven't really. We should try it. We can try it. Sure, we should yeah, try I mean, it. It would be, I guess, a more it. complicated experiment, but yeah. I yeah, I mean, the device is still this this device has been it's quite the amazing thing about it is it's really robust. We've warmed up and cooled down the cryostat intentionally and unintentionally now, you know, a dozen times and the device keeps living. So that's an interesting idea. Could we. Like, I have to think about what pulse sequence one would want to use mm -hmm. to do that. And yeah, I, I mean, it would be like a pi pulse and a, like, you know, analogous of a pi pulse. I do not know in this case how it would work out, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is so I I have not thought about this particular point. I don't see any reason why, in principle, you couldn't do it. Um, sure. And I'm definitely going to have this conversation with my with Cameron later this afternoon to see if she might be able to figure out. All right. We could just give it a shot. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Vivek. Any uh, other questions? Any other questions from the audience? Uh, if not, let's thanks uh, Johannes uh, for the great talk by using the applause button uh, that we have. <laughs> but uh, uh, thanks Johannes for coming, uh, giving us this wonderful talk. And uh, next time you're in Bangalore, please visit us. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Um, great. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Yep. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you for saying this.